Ah, it's a little late night up here. It's also really dark outside, so I'd say it's late night. I think we're good. Steve, if Buddy. that is your real name. How you doing? Good, man. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. First Come quiz on, question. Right? How long have we known each other? 18 years. It's actually pretty close. 17. Uh, do you remember where we first yeah. met? No. CIO Summit 2007, I think it is. I got that one wrong. All right. Uh, where are you working now? Uh, so I have been at Forrester Research for 11 years, but uh, four years ago we acquired a company called Feedback Now, and uh, I was CIO at Forrester, and as you know, um, we decided uh, a couple of years ago to just run it as a separate company, and I, I quit my CIO job to take that over, and we run it very separately. So there is a job after CIO? Yes. Oh, now everyone knows. Yes. So now I don't have to hear about everyone's <laughs> laptops and you know, things like that. I, I bet you still get a laptop call every now and then. Um, but I, I know exactly who to send it to. So tell us about Feedback Now. So Feedback Now, Forrester believed in the age of the customer. Customers have the ultimate power. They're walking around with computers. They have social media. And so we leaned into it, and we bought this company, which has three little buttons. We were airports all over the world. They're out of Switzerland. Did anybody see buttons today? Walking around. And it looks very simple, but the idea is that most companies use surveys to figure out what customers want. But that's a, it's a, like a monthly, weekly, maybe at, at best daily operation. Getting a, a survey after you've gotten off the plane, like who cares? I've, I'm left. <laughs> I don't need to help you. So Whereas feedback now is why, right why here. Why Forrester, though? Well, Forrester, you know, the, the CEO and founder of Forrester, he's very forward thinking. He thought, what could be more? We teach customer obsession. We, we evangelize customer. What could be more customer obsessed than instrumenting up every aspect of your customer experience, getting all this data, helping companies find this, figure out this new way of operating customer experience in real time, like in the moment. Like, don't, don't figure out, oh, I better have some lines open here. No to open this line now. No to help this patient now. And that's also great data. Um, so for the long term, thinking about Forrester, it's really understanding what's going on in real time at a, at a micro level. And then bringing in all this other data. So you look at three buttons and you think, oh, well, it's pretty There's simple, three right? Buttons, but what right? if you're bringing in traffic data near that rest stop or uh, staffing data in that hospital and you're correlating that with when the floors were cleaned and what the weather was like outside, and all of a sudden you're figuring out patterns. Then you're going from, oh, I'm doing things on a regular basis to I'm doing things dynamically. I know exactly when to apply my resources to minimize customer pain and minimize cost. It's like a perfect can, solution. Can we pull up the buttons, the results from today? Yeah. Is that doable? Is that Kevin, can we make the make magic, magic man in the back is going to pull up some so there were a few buttons scattered around. You might have got to see them. You might not have. But uh, I thought that uh, uh, some of these were particularly interesting. Uh, we should be able to get them up here in a second. But did anybody press the buttons? Mm, a couple of people. A couple of people. Some people don't want to admit it. Um, has anybody seen these buttons outside of today? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of that. So um, no. let's see what the, uh, the results were. A lot of people wonder, where does it go? <laughs> what do they now do with it? Now when you press the button, you get to see what it is. OK. So we learned about the first one. So the first one was about why, I think, why My did you attire? come? No, no, not your attire hasn't oh, no, started. No, no, I think I voted. I liked it. Yeah. Liked that was me anticipating. <laughs> We're not there yet. OK. The first question, I think, was, oh, there's, there's don't, don't push, push red. Don't push red. 75% okay. of people push red. <laughs> By the way, if that doesn't tell you everything about the psyche of this yeah. conference. <laughs> There's, do I like pushing buttons? 76% of people pressed yeah, yes. Makes sense. Although if you press no, was it so bad? I mean, if you press no, yeah. why were you pressing uh, the button? Registration, no. I've <laughs> got 21 hey. green ones. Uh, That's pretty good. Good job to the registration crew. Yeah. I mean, you're all out here, so thank you. And then I think there was another one. So we had a whole set of. Uh, Real-time data gathering. The first question was, I think, why did you come 
to, uh, did you come here for? Primary reason. Uh, yeah. Was it and for it, networking, for the content, or for both? Both, and, and both was the winner. All right. And then this, the other one was about uh, your environment, I think, was it? All physical, all digital, or hybrid? Overwhelmingly hybrid, hybrid yeah. yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, curious about the ones who are absolutely not going to the office, uh, the one that was also 100% in the office. Uh, be, be interested to know who you are. Uh, cool. I mean, I think that's really interesting. Um, so obviously, this is kind of one way to deploy this at events. Yeah, uh, what else kind of, you know, can the technology do? So what we found is that for feedback now to sing, it, it's got to be a highly transactional. This is nice. Not this is not really what we do. Events and whatever we did it just you know to to please you. But I like the buttons. <laughs> I press the buttons. But you know what we're, we're used for, for example, in hospitals. Hospitals, when you are a patient at the hospital, uh, you go home a month later. Right around when you get your bill, you also get two fat surveys. Some people take them. Uh, how hospitals do in those surveys is, is how the government determines how much money to give them in, in reimbursement. So there's a real big incentive to do well in surveys. We are put in hospital rooms, in, in patient rooms, in waiting rooms, in all sorts of places in the hospital. Uh, patients press red. They come immediately. So when, when the patient is asked the question, were they attentive to your needs, how can you not give that hospital the highest mark? It's just a, another level of service beyond the one that they're used to getting. So we raise their scores, and that means direct money. We're also used in, in airports at the end of a security line. So there's a great story where it doesn't matter that it's not just that there's green, yellow, and red, but we have people counters, and we know um, we can know the average wait time through security. And that there's a correlation, not exciting, right? takes a minute to go through, everyone's happy. It takes an hour, everyone's angry. But between point A and point B, people all get pissed right around the same time. They tend to act like a herd. And if you're the TSA and you know that what that time is, 14 minutes, then you don't wait till everyone gets angry. You open up, a, well, you should be opening up a new line at 13 minutes. They often don't, but that's another story. But that's the idea is you f we've helped airports find out what that behavioral pattern looks like and how to operate around it. So you, you've made the jump from, I'll call it CIO, to business unit owner, general manager, CEO of this kind of you know, internal startup. Uh, what are the lessons that you've learned in doing that? What is the, the you know, I'll call it the one shining moment where, gosh, I made a mistake? <laughs> or you know what? Uh, thank God I don't have to deal with that anymore. Uh, from CIO world or from CEO world? Well, from CIO into CEO, now that you're in the CEO-ish chair. Um, I didn't really, so at, at, I don't want to malign my own company, but. We'll pretend it's a different company. Yeah, we'll don't pretend it's a different that. company. As the CIO, I heard a lot of complaints about how hard it was to operate our internal systems. And I'm worried about security. We got, we got agile plans. We got all sorts of stuff. And they're just complaining. Then I step out, and I become a user of that stuff. And I go, oh, now I know what they're complaining about. Uh, and I think the lesson they were right. <laughs> they might have been a little right. The lesson was clearly, you know, live it a little. Bit. You've got to live. There's no, there's no uh, um, alternative to living it. As soon as I live, as soon as I had to deal with processing a deal, as soon as I had to like wait for you know the deal desk to hold me up because of some legal because of the systems were so rigid. Uh, yeah, I got a very different take on, uh, I bet. on, on the, I bet. the services that we provide. Cool. Um, well, I'm sure we'll have more to talk about, but um, I'll ask oh, you. Oh, we, we, we got to do the, the address, the QR code. You tell so me. we have one last, okay, you got one more minute? One last thing, if you could, uh, scan the QR code, and it's going to ask you for um, what you think about Anthony's, um, I shouldn't throw rocks here. <laughs> what do we feel about Anthony's dress today? Is it My green, entire? yellow, red, and then your reason for why red? So I don't know if you want, like, does it match? And then we'll put up those results. As soon as everybody's done scanning, you could just see it in real time while the person's coming up maybe to crunch time. All right. You could see, and then you can make your, uh, your call when I'm done. Sounds like a plan. All right. Uh, I appreciate it. We'll scoot you on down, and uh, I believe, Vina, thank you so much, Steve. Vina, come on up. Hi. 
Welcome. Thank you. Please have a seat. So uh, I know that we haven't had a chance to chat, so this should be both exciting and scary. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm currently the Chief of Staff to the Chief Information and Operations Officer at Guardian Life. I'm their former Head of Corporate Social Responsibility, and I recently took on another role as Head of Enterprise ESG, which, is, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Those are a lot of things to put together. It's a lot of things to put together. What does that really mean on a day-to-day -day basis for you? So I think of being Head of Enterprise ESG as being Chief of Staff for all things that are ESG at the company. And it was a really strategic, I think, strategic move on my part to leave my work, my role in corporate social responsibility, which was embedded kind of in a marketing, marketing communications function. I think there are a lot of companies that do that. Um, and become the right-hand person for our chief information and operations officer. Um, Dean Del Vecchio, who was our CIO, came in in that role and eventually took on operations. And it's really interesting, the intersection between technology and operations. Um, and how integral it is that we actually work together. So he's got two jobs, but I think it's really important that, that he has both of them. Um, and it was strategic to move from what was seen as kind of a marketing communications function to then working for an executive who had influence over everything. Does that right? change like some of the, I'll call it, you know, greenwashing kind of, you know, mantra or perception? I think it totally changes the perception. So I'm, I'm very interested in the topic of where do these functions sit? So I'm thinking about corporate social responsibility, inclusion and diversity, ESG, lots of acronyms, right? At Guardian, we call it JEDI. You've got IND, DEI, CSR, ESG. I mean, it's, I don't care about the letters, but where it sits and what they do is what's really important. Um, and, and so- and It sounds like the operation side of that actually might be the more important piece than I'll call it the IT side of it, or is it somehow equally- integrated? I think, I actually think that this, the, the remit of the CIO has really just increased over the past number of years. And, and for me, I think ESG is a natural extension of that. When we think about the, in, you know, the impact of technology in terms of it enabling our employees, in terms of enabling our customers, in terms of enabling the business, nothing would be possible without technology. And so when you have a CIO kind of championing this work, that's where the cultural shift happens. That's where you can actually embed this kind of lens into every role within an organization. So I guess maybe to go a little bit more personal, uh, what was your first job? I sold knives <laughs> at age <laughs> Cut 15, Co. Cutco. Yeah, Cutco. I still use my Cutco knives, hey by the way. So. Stand by the product, That's I right. like it. What made you transition into the, at least, you know, corporate world and the things that you're, you're doing now? How did you get to Guardian? So I was originally a microfinance practitioner. I worked at the United Nations and the World Bank. And it was really focused in on empowering women who fell below the poverty line to help them build their own micro enterprises, small businesses. Um, and I did that work uh, more internationally. I spent a couple of years in India. I came back to the United States. Um, I went to business school and felt like it was really time to get the, learn the tips and the tricks and the tools to help make an impact. Meaning, I went into management consulting. Uh. Um, I spent a couple of years at the Boston Consulting Group and thought, you know what? Now is a chance to kind of merge that social impact work with the tools that I've learned, right, being a consultant and working in the private sector. And for me, corporate social responsibility was a nice intersection at the time. So Steve, how much have you been doing in order to do microfinance and save the world? <laughs> what was the question? Uh, <laughs> does an ESG group exist within Forrester within Feedback Now? Uh, not within Feedback Now. Um, we tried to make our packaging, uh, you know, more socially, uh, uh, you know, more more um, recyclable. But in Forrester, there's a huge ESG practice. They do that a ton sense. of research on Absolutely. this. Stuff. Yeah, uh, what was your first job? You mean like high school? I don't know. Was it Cutco <laughs> knives, paper? No, what did you well, do? First real. I was in the Air Force out of college, but I mean, the first real job I think was. Carvel ice cream. I think there's some other military branches yeah. here that would say that uh, Air Force is also not a, a real job. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Thank you for uh -oh. your service. Oh, <laughs> come on. Some of you have at least been in other branches of the military. I know. Uh, so I think back to you, Vina. Uh, if I think of uh, a lot of kind of what's next for you in your career as you're trying to get things done, 
do you find that you know the conversations you're having and the tactical aspects of what you're doing um, is this you know, is there a, a direction that you're kind of steering towards that you know is more embedded as a function that it should just be a part of everything or how, how do you get from you know where you are now yep. to kind of that future state of really achieving those ESG goals so I left what I love doing because it was just a slice of the pie so you make the strategic move to leave these various verticals so that you can be the convener, you can be the connector, right? And so that's why I call myself the chief of staff of all things ESG. Um, and it's really, it's, it's sort of this multi-year process, right, of bringing everybody together. We have our business colleagues, we have our technology colleagues, we have operations, we have DEI, CSR, we have our compliance folks, we have our enterprise risk folks, we have our investments colleagues, this is a, I work at an insurance company, um, and we're all having the conversations. And so it's a, it's, it's a, again, like a multi-year journey where it's a, there's a lot of education and a lot of collaboration. Um, eventually, so that these colleagues are empowered to do the work themselves. They don't need me, right? Eventually, I should not have a job. And that's the goal. Or should there be like a, a CESGO? I just, I don't think you need a chief. I mean, this is me personally. So, you know, there are many people who have different opinions. but. I don't think we should have a chief diversity officer or a chief sustainability officer or a chief social impact officer. I mean, these are things that should be embedded within the it culture, the fabric of, of an organization. So everybody takes ownership for it, no matter like where you work, no matter what your role is. Fair enough. I hope we get there. Um, thank you. Um, if you could scoot down, we're going to call up our last guests. Could Andrew Stanley please come to the stage? Let's <laughs> nice Cheers, you almost fell off of that. Thing. I know. I'm How many of these have you had? Six. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Uh, State your name and occupation, sir. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, Andrew Stanley, I am the Chief Technology Officer for Mars Incorporated. Which, as we talked about earlier, is yes. a bump. Uh, yes, congratulations on the promotion. Cheers, brother. Cheers. Uh, what was your first job? To, to, to do first job would have been peeling eggs for my dad in his kitchen. First paying job was working on a lobster boat. So you didn't get paid for peeling the eggs? I feel like that's child labor. Uh, both jobs <laughs> are child labor, ah, clearly, okay. very clearly. But at least yes. you got paid for the lobster boat. I, at least I got paid for okay. the lobster boat, yeah. So the peeling eggs was slave child labor? Uh, the, yes, it okay. was uh, training, as my dad training would call it. Training, important, important. His way of teaching us to go to college. Uh, where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up outside of Boston. OK, still there? Yeah. I did a. Uh, eight-year turn south of D.C. Got and it. And came back home. And why are the Yankees so much better than the Red Sox? You know, the Yankees and Red Sox have a hallowed history <laughs> and spirited rivalry, and uh, I'm glad to call them my rivals. Fair enough. Um, so uh, in your new role, uh, mm -hmm. obviously things are slightly different. Um, if you had advice to give to your former CISO self, mm -hmm. what would it be? realize that security is a gravy train that no one else is riding on. <laughs> so it is literally just the thing to print checks. It really is. It Makes really sense. is. So do you then uh, regret this? Uh, OK, fair enough. Got I figured it. that was going to be the answer, but you, know, you have to ask. Uh, who would win in a fight? Uh, one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses? 100 duck-sized horses. Why? Uh, because have you ever been kicked by a horse? No. Imagine getting kicked by a hundred little horses. Have you horses. seen a very big duck? I feel I, like it's, it's, it's a duck. You just throw bread at it all day long all right. and it'll chase it and run around and quack at you. Fair, I'll take it. You can't, get, you it. can't, you can't lead a horse to water. NFTs, blockchain, this whole kind of thing, uh, what do you think about it? I, mean, I think it, it, it's a really compelling concept. I think what Starbucks announced yesterday is one of the first real compelling campaigns because no one outside of us knows it's an NFT. No one knows. It creates a very rich customer experience and a hyper loyal consumer base, providing them with the experience of exclusivity, uh, while at the same time allowing uh, Starbucks to get closer to their consumers. I think that's one really killer application. Are, are there conversations around the ESG side of this? Like, I know there's a lot of hype that basically people say, oh, it burns a whole lot of you know, energy and it's very inefficient. Like, is that a part of this ESG conversation for anything you guys are thinking about in blockchain or even just general? I mean, we've been talking about it more. I mean, we're, we're a fairly small company, so we were talking about in, in terms of moving from our, you know, on-prem to going to the cloud, right? And then there, there's a lot of ESG chalk around what that actually means and is going to the cloud actually um, 
sustainable, right, for the companies that are actually, you know, providing these services. But I think it's, I think it's a topic that, you know, kind of affects all industries, all sectors. I, I wonder if the math ever really works out that, like, blockchain is so absolutely horrible compared to, I don't know, Amazon or, like, anybody that, you know, you're happy to go order something and have it show up the next day. But uh, maybe that's my two cents. Um, Steve, do you have a, a weigh-in on this whole uh, blockchain NFT debate? Uh, just the, I remember, like, arguing in the 90s about Napster and everyone was saying, <laughs> oh, Napster is going, I said, you know what, I don't know if Napster is going to win. But I know that the companies charging me $20 for a 30 cent CD are going to lose. Like someone's going to win. And I think the same thing holds here. I don't know exactly if it's going to be exactly what it is today, but it's clearly going to be something. I'm kind of really interested to see what it does with like medical, like why can't I have my own medical records? Yeah. Yeah. You know, who's coming out with that? You know, like, so there's a use here somewhere. Maybe, the, maybe there's a million uses. I don't know what it's going to be. It may not be this, but it's going to be something. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the internet is a fad, right? So, yeah. you know. Ultimately, um, and while I will say there is some merit behind that, because realistically what we know is Web 2 concept will go away. The question is on what time scale and what's going to happen. Um, we're obviously in drinks and thinks. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Uh, gin and tonic. Ooh, Andrew. Uh, favorite drink? I know what someone else is ordering at the bar later. That's right, uh, Jet Pilot. Jet Pilot. Jet I'm Pilot. It's the top of the Tiki Cannon. Okay. Either that or I'm drinking uh, straight rum. I've never had a Jet Pilot. Please explain. So Jet Pilot is a uh, uh, it's a rum built tiki cocktail. Also involves uh, uh, what else? We got we got some absinthe in there. You have some uh, grapefruit juice in there. You have some lime juice in there. You have a couple other. There's some uh, orgeat in there as well. So it. it's just a really good time. It is an <laughs> amazing time. <laughs> an amazing time. It's a party in your Jet mouth. Pilot. Yes. yes. Right. I don't think we have those out there, but let's give it a shot. No, <laughs> yeah. Vina, do you have a favorite drink? I'm very simple. I love a good glass of red wine. I'm particular to Italian. Chianti, Nebbiolo, um, I really like um, Multipulciano d'Abruzzo's. I think they're very good. All right. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, okay, last question, because all of these people want to go drink Jet Pilots. Uh, <laughs> If you had to create an epitaph for yourself, something that was the lasting moniker, the thing that you want everyone to know, what would it be? I will rip off Hunter S. Thompson. It never got fast enough for me. Greatest epitaph of all time. I do like it. Vina? Um, she tried and she enabled. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with she succeeded. So I think, I think <laughs> that sounds a, t a little too bleak. Steve. Um, he tried to be nice to people, and hopefully it all comes back. Hmm. I don't know. I need a few more drinks for that. I think I'm going to go with uh, there is treasure buried here. <laughs> uh, let's see what happens. Um, well, I love uh, that all of you came up and shared, and I appreciate getting a little personal and, and taking some time. So I will cheers to you. Cheers. 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 Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, and uh, I believe it is now about cocktail hour. But before we go, I'm going to do one, two, three rounds of applause. Number one, round of applause for our lovely vendors. <laughs> Number two, round of applause for our wonderful sponsors, uh, Chrome OS, Monica Minolta, uh, Castanella. Uh, and number three, a round of applause for all of you guys uh, because you are all amazing and doing such a phenomenal job of being here and that's all you had to do because for the past two years you didn't, right? Uh, so cheers, here's to you. Cheers. Uh, and I'd also love to thank our wonderful events team who was very, very helpful in putting all of this together and so uh, infinite support to them. Uh, and with that, this has been the Late Night CIO Show. I welcome everyone, go get a drink, let's have some fun. <laughs>